Hello and welcome to the Majlis, Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty's current affairs podcast focusing on Central Asia. I'm Mohammed Tahir, the host of the Majlis and Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty's media manager here in Washington, D.C. For the past couple of days, the Turkish delegation led by Foreign Minister Mevlut Çavuşoğlu has been touring Central Asia. In their last stop in Kyrgyzstan, along with ceremonial talks about friendship, the delegation also announced the establishment of the first Marif schools, which is sponsored by the Turkish state. On their way to Kyrgyzstan, Çavuşoğlu and his delegation also stopped by in Uzbekistan and in Turkmenistan, where Saidis spoke about expanding bilateral relations, trade and collaborations in various sectors. It was a high-profile Turkish visit to the region after some time, but more than a visit, the context in which the trip has taken place might be worth noting. So what does this trip really mean? And what is ahead in Turkish Central Asia relations? To discuss all these, I'm joined by from Bishkek Medet Toliganov, a department chair and professor at the American University of Central Asia, Gulberna Özcan, a reader in international business and entrepreneurship at Royal Holloway University of London. Dr. Özcan is originally from Turkey and from Prague. Bruce Panier, the editor of Radio Free Radio Liberty Central Asia blog, Kishlok Owazi. Thank you very much, colleagues, for joining us. Uh, Bruce, should we start with the general? overview of talks uh, that he has been having in Central Asia with local leaders. Perhaps any highlights, any takeaways from there, and then we will expand uh, on it. So, uh, Bruce, what are your notes about the visit? Well, I mean, there's obviously there's a lot of things for them to talk about. Of course, he went to the to Turkic speaking countries, you know, so there's there's a natural relationship between Turkey and the three countries that he visited to begin with. You know, Turkey's really um, stepping forward on the in the international arena. It's it's influence. You know, we we see what what's going on in Northern Africa and the Middle East. You know, so I, I think this is a little bit more of that. They're kind of pressing their advantage that their their star is ascendant, so to speak, at the moment. So they're in the news a lot. Their foreign policy is not only active, but it seems to be fairly successful. So I think they're really moving forward on that. You know, they, they want to get better trade ties with the Central Asian countries. And of course, that's something that the Central Asian countries wanted right after they became independent. Certainly the Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan, the, the so-called Turkic speaking countries, you know, and, and part of Turkey's new role in um you know, in international politics is, is that they're trying to get involved with Afghan talks and they want to hold some of these Afghan peace talks too. So I'm sure they wanted to consult with some of the countries, the countries in Central Asia who have been involved with Afghanistan, you know, in relations with the Afghan government for some time now, kind of coordinate their views on what's happening out there. So it, it really went across the board. I mean, you know, there's in Uzbekistan, it looked like the Uzbeks were willing to buy some Turkish military equipment. So there was a, you know, there was a cultural angle to it. There was a trade angle to it, improvement and relations between the countries generally. And then, like I said, Turkey appears to be ready to play, try its hand at playing peacemaker in Afghanistan, too. So that was another reason why they wanted to go and uh, I think and check with everybody and make sure that uh, they had all the information that the Central Asians were willing to share with them. And they were all as much as possible on the same page going into mm. the Afghan talks. Mm. Anything? Anyone else wants to add in this? Sure, yes. I think it is uh, very positive and good that Mr. Chaosholo has been touring the region and uh, working towards uh, better relations because uh, current ruling party, AKP, for a long time pursued policies uh, with zero problems with the neighbors uh, that improved many things, but eventually abandoned its soft power attitude and became a hard power and got involved in Syria in armed conflict conflicts in Libya and certainly recently in the Caucasus. So this comes at a time when Turkish foreign policy is highly imbued in various conflicts and To be honest, it's stuck in many ways. And that seems to be a reversal from the earlier position that more or less ignored Central Asia and later was also affected or poisoned by the negative relations with the Gulenist uh, movement and their schools across the region Mm. that put a lot of pressure on governments to close down those schools. And the President Erdogan and AKP has actually had some angry exchanges uh, with the region's uh, governments. 
So that may be a start, a new start, which is good. But let me say a couple of also not so perhaps positive things that what is happening in Turkey politically perhaps is not as rosy as uh, what it seems to be um, showing itself as a force uh, moving forward. Uh, One has to do with the, of course, whether Turkey is a role model or a good model for Central Asia. Unfortunately, with the growing one party authoritarianism, Turkish democracy is in trouble. And that is certainly a concern. Uh, Secondly, the economy is in a very bad shape, especially with the COVID-19, as in other places. There is a very high unemployment, huge income inequality, and regional uh, disparities. And finally, unfortunately, there is a growing desecularization and a slip towards a one-party dictated uh, religious agenda. Uh, so f- looking at what Turkey is today domestically doesn't make me feel actually mm. um, quite excited about its potential projections in the region. Mm. I it doesn't really have enough economic muscle. It really doesn't have a good governance to to present itself as a good brotherly partner for future of these regimes in the region. And it seems to be that the President Erdogan and the ruling AKP are basically juggling things around, perhaps in preparation with the Biden-era international Mm. relations. So I'm a bit cynical, as you can see. Perhaps I should stop here. Right. You know, in terms of the points that you raised about Turkey uh, sliding into a different direction than what it was known for during the early days of AKP. Speaking of those domestic challenges, though, Gulberna, the situation in Central Asia is rather even more complicated than what you are seeing in Turkey. So from that perspective, I guess there is nothing to be really surprised about for the Turkish side and the Central Asian side. So, you know, um, I can't really speak about the role models anymore. So on that, Amedet, how is Turkey seen from where you are? I mean, uh, certainly things have changed in the way those nations looked at each other compared to the era following the collapse of the Soviet Union. I think if there was any golden era in Central Asia, Turkey's relations, I guess that was the era immediately after the collapse of the Soviet Union and early days of the independence of those Central Asian nations. So how is Turkey seen these days from the region? Uh, yeah, I would agree with Gulberna that, uh, of course, now not so much talks about the Turk as a role model. I remember just uh, nine, ten years ago, there been some discussions in Kyrgyzstan about the development of parliamentarism and then uh, Turkish universities, I mean, the government, Turkish-supported universities, were organizing this kind of forums, how Turkey can become a model for parliamentarism. Of course, nowadays, there are no such talks. So in that sense, it's mostly like about the crude politics, geopolitics, and, of course, what was mentioned about the this, uh, recent Karabakh war and then... Uh, trying to reassert itself and maybe find a new position in this just in Caucasus in Central Asia and it's one of the motivations that's how it is viewed from here to see how this visit by a Turkish uh, foreign minister is taking place at least in Kyrgyzstan and maybe it's uh, taking stock on what has been done so far in terms of developing Turkish maybe soft power diplomacy especially in the wake of still ongoing COVID and Turkey was also trying to use this medical soft power diplomacy uh, and um, foreign minister came here he also held some event related to the opening of the Turkish hospital mm. and of course opening of this Marif foundation and the first school it's another added element of this uh, soft power tool and etc i think it's uh, trying to resort itself and capitalize on something which turkey has invested so far and of course uh, attacking gulenist movement and uh, talking about the feta because uh, the foreign minister gave number of interviews here he mentioned about that as well and maybe trying to sense uh, what would be the positioning of turkey after this uh, war in karabakh in vis-a-vis maybe russia i think that's also something which uh, is uh, was at least not explicitly but still on the agenda and when it comes of course to kyrgyzstan it's uh, because we have a new president and new leadership and the course of the country is still not very much clearly shaped and maybe that's at least within this whole regional package kyrgyzstan may look like as a certain now the testing ground to see how opportunities can be utilized. Of course, from the Kyrgyz leadership, we have a certain geopolitical protocol, the visit of our first team just two months ago, like the president to Russia, to neighboring countries, and of course, talks and calls with China and then with, uh, with Erdogan, and of course, with invitation by Erdogan to visit Turkey. So seemingly that uh, geopolitical protocol will include at some point a visit maybe by Japan. 
love to Turkey. Mm-hmm. So in that sense, I think for the Turkish side, it's also important to test the ground with a new president of Kyrgyzstan. Mm-hmm. Interesting. On the Marif school, Ahmed, it, it was kind of interesting to me too. I don't know, maybe it was expected that the, the sides have agreed on, on the establishment of Turkish state-sponsored Marif school, when, which in my understanding will take over the, the school so far run by the Turkish fl- uh, cleric of Fethullah Gulen, I guess? I think so far, at least the Kyrgyz government within the last few years tried to evade pressure from the Turkish yeah. side to close the schools because what the government of Kyrgyzstan has done so far is tried to rename the schools. It's not Sebat, but Sapat. It's like you're trying to make the Kyrgyz sound version of the name of this mm. network of schools, trying to change its charter. The government became also the co- co-founder of this uh, network of schools, and etc. But uh, otherwise, I think in overall operations were not very much uh, affected as such. And the Kyrgyz government, based on the last two or three presidents, tried to withstand the pressure. Mm. From, the, so uh, what, from Turkey. What I was saying is like um, the, the Marif Foundation, this is going to take over all those Gulenist schools or it's going to be a separate entity? I'm just trying to understand um, yeah, what the rule... Yeah, so far it uh, goes as, as a separate entity, yes. Oh, uh, okay. It will be in parallel, competing, and then mm. of course the pressure will still go diplomatically and otherwise, but uh, so far it exists in parallel. Mm. It's to Okay. Networks. So, yeah, it, it clearly shows that there is still some sort of resistance by the Kyrgyz authorities against uh, Turkish demands involving wiping out Gulen movement and its infrastructure in Kyrgyzstan. It's very interesting. As we recall, following the 2016 failed court attempt in Turkey, Ankara has been uh, sending strong signals to the region to crack down against the movement, and Kyrgyzstan was one of the countries dodging the Turkish demand, so to say. So I guess in this situation, I just wonder whether... The question of the Gulen moment ever came up during the bilateral talks between Chaosholo and Kyrgyz authorities this time. I haven't seen in official statements anything like that. Maybe behind the closed doors, that was, of course, I would suppose, was raised. But I've seen uh, in some interviews which uh, Foreign Minister of Turkey gave to local media that that issue was explicitly stated yeah, in, the, in the interviews. What and in that sense, it was, of course, a signal. What was the Kyrgyz government and to neighboring countries as well? Yeah, what, what was your... Uh, can I chip in there? Because I have traveled in the region several years, and most recently I was there about a year ago, and I have actually discussed this issue with some of the people who wanted to talk about it. The Gulenist organization has been a secretive fraternity group that actually was promoted by the ruling AKP and Erdogan for years. When I was in Central Asia, Turkish diplomats were told to help this organization. Yeah. So they received enormous support from the government to get organized and have easy access to resources and politicians yeah. in Kazakhstan, in Kyrgyzstan. Uzbekistan actually was different. Karimov didn't want them there because uh, he found them mm. intrusive. Mm. But and that was before this uh, 2016 before, alleged coup yes, attempt what in Turkey. Is, yes. And what happened is the former allies turned into enemies especially after the coup in failed coup in 2016 the current government and the leadership Erdogan himself the president wanted to completely dismantle this organization but both AKP and the Gulenists were extremely close in their alliance and that turned into a vendetta uh, after that fallout they wanted to see all governments close down these schools but by that time obviously these schools had students teachers and a certain societal effects and, and linkages. So, for example, Almazbek, I believe, refused to do so, and there was a angry exchange between Erdogan and him, and, and there were other disputes. I think now what the ruling government, AKP, wants to do is to transfer some of the resources of these things to a, a government-led system or open a completely new channel of education. I guess we, we, we have to see. But the problem is that this former alliance really opened the gate of Central Asia to Gulenists to get organized and establish schools. And this organization was neither accountable nor transparent, but because they relied on the AKP's power, they were tolerated. Even the Turkish diplomats and consulates were told to help them to expand in Central Asia. So that's actually the irony of the whole thing. 
Right, definitely. Just to put uh, this in context, like for those of our listeners who might not be aware of the details of what we are talking about in terms of the Gulenists here. So the Gulenist movement, so that uh, since the 2016 coup attempt in Turkey in Turkish state's position about the alleged involvement of Gulen in that event, Ankara has been pressing the international community, including Kyrgyzstan, with various degrees of success to hand over Gulen-owned schools and distance themselves from the any followers that Gulen uh, moment might have in those countries. So that's the context uh, in which we are talking about this. Uh, just uh, one more point, though, made it, we, I know we need to talk about the other two countries, too. How many schools are we talking about here in terms of the Gulen-owned or Gulen-led in Kyrgyzstan? Uh, saying honest, I cannot tell uh, the exact number. I would say that it's uh, over 10. Mm. So it's quite a sizable network. At least it's the biggest uh, network of schools mm-hmm. and uh, yes it's uh, quite uh, notable and famous and uh, maybe that's also one of the reasons why it could withstand also mm-hmm. the pressure from outside as well as from mm-hmm. someone who's in the country. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay. So in Turkmenistan, uh, Brusan, I guess the, the most important of all, Cho Sholo, was asked about the, the possible Turkish involvement in the development of friendship energy fields. We are talking about here the gas fields in the middle of the Caspian Sea, the ownership of which was disputed between Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan, and they have recently agreed to jointly develop those fields. So to me, nothing really stands out in terms of what Turkey might be thinking about in terms of its contribution or the partnership in that field, but has there anything else you have seen that might have taken place during his visit to Turkmenistan? Any other noteworthy development there? Uh, yeah, you know, actually he said that there would be um, trilateral meetings and, mm. and even a summit between Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan and Turkey. Uh, and, it, and he said it would be a, it soon. Uh, he didn't name any dates, but but he said the summit, for instance, he said Erdogan was our, had already agreed that he would mm. You know, meet with with um, Aliyev and and Berdy uh, and talk about this. And he didn't say so much what what Turkish involvement would be in the specific field, this Dostluk field in the in the middle of the Caspian, uh, which is oil and gas. But but he certainly signaled that you know that Turkish companies were looking at the project. And of course, we know that the most likely route for this oil and gas to get out for export would be through Turkey. So, uh, you know, they were active. He did discuss this very issue when he was in Turkmenistan. And, and did you know, as well as I, considering the, the problems, economic problems Turkmenistan's mm-hmm. having, uh, it must have been very well-received news for them that, that uh, Turkey was so enthusiastic about helping to open up this field and get the oil and gas exported. Mm-hmm. You know, just an interesting kind of point. Our Turkmen service, uh, Azatlik, was reporting today that the Turkmen state media has been sort of deliberately avoiding the mention of the Turkish president's possible visit to Turkmenistan, which apparently is taking place maybe sometime around June or July this year. That was interesting. So I couldn't make sense of why this is the case. But what about Uzbekistan, Bruce? Is there anything that we should be paying attention in terms of what happened there during Chaosholo's visit? Any discussion, any important decisions being made? Well, I mean, they opened up a new consulate in, in Samarkand, of course. And like I said, the, one of the more intriguing things, although it was buried way down there in all the reports about his visit, was, was the Uzbek purchase of Turkish military equipment. And they didn't mm. say what exactly. But we know after what happened in Nagorno-Karabakh that there's been a run on trying to purchase Turkish drones. And I, I suspect that's probably what, what a lot of the conversation was about. You know, again, I, I know that things have changed in Turkey a lot, but the, but in the early 90s, this was in you know, 1992, 1993, this was really the partner that as Uzbekistan specifically really wanted. They, they wanted to offset Russian influence, and, and they looked at Turkey as, as the model of, uh, you know, kind of a model for them at that time anyway. You know, there was a government that was secular, but but it was also Islamic country. You know, the, the like I said, the cultural, the linguistic affinities that they had with each other. Other. So I, you know, I think I think uh, really all the countries, but but uh, you know specifically Uzbekistan, all the countries in Central Asia, they they don't want to be caught in a vice between Russia and China, you know, for their their foreign pol- to try to balance their foreign policy. And Turkey opens up a kind of a new a new avenue for them, uh, you know, not new exactly, but but it does give them another option, right. uh, you know, which they wanted, like I said, for years and years. So the 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 timing was was very fortuitous for this. It does help to strengthen the Central Asian's positions when they're dealing with Moscow or Beijing mm. in the future. Mm. Um, you know, 
And you have this new, well, or at least improving ties recently with Turkey. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, Bruce. You know, any any increased European or U.S. activity in Central Asia starts drawing eyebrows in, in Russia and China. And Central Asia is not really in a position to uh, upset um, those two partners. So in this context, Turkey seems to be the least controversial partner that Central Asia can look at, which is at least a known uh, quantity for, for the region and its allies across the border. So, But when you look into, you know, what Mr. Chow Sholo has been doing in Central Asia during his trip. Uh, there wasn't much going on in, in practical terms. It's, it's clear that there wasn't much on the agenda when the trip was planned. I mean, we have not seen any, any major breakthrough in the bilateral relationship as a result of this trip. So how to make sense of this trip, the timing of this trip? Or, or maybe there is, there is something in the background, in the context, which we don't know. So where our eyes should be going forward to understand what has just happened and where things are had it going forward from here. Um, Let's continue the discussion talking about these and many other questions very shortly. But first, let me recap the debate today on the Majlis podcast. I'm joined by Medit Toliganov, a department chair and professor at the American University of Central Asia, based in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. Gulberna Özcan, a reader in international business and entrepreneurship at the Royal Holloway University of London. Dr. Özcan is originally from Turkey. And Bruce Panier, the editor of Radio Free the Liberty Central Asia blog, Kishlok Owazi. Bruce is joining us from Prague. I'm Mohamed Tahir, Radio Free Free the Liberty's media manager in host of the Mejlis podcast here in Washington, D.C., and we are discussing Turkish-Central Asia relations in the context of Turkish Foreign Minister's regional visit this week. So, yeah, we have been talking about this visit like a kind of a regional tour of Turkic-speaking countries in Central Asia, but Çoşoğlu was not in Kazakhstan. How do you read that? That's actually very interesting, and it is uh, not clear exactly what could be the reason. Let's go back to one step. Why this trip is taking place now has a lot to do with Turkey's foreign policy orientation that led to various blunders and mistakes, but more recently involved in regional disputes uh, through a kind of hard power. And I have the sense that by showing its weight in uh, Western Asia and in relation to Turkic states, Turkey might be leveraging that relationship towards its relations with the EU and the USA. And I certainly the new Biden administration has not yet formally established a contact with Erdogan. And what I read that he is increasingly expecting a call, but hasn't hasn't reached him yet. So that, to me, looks like a reorientation and showing the Turkey's hand to to EU and uh, the US. The other issue is the S-400s that Turkey purchased from Russia. But Turkey is also involved in a couple of tense relationships with Russia in Syria, in Libya, as well as in the Caucasus in, in Azerbaijan in terms of the recent uh, conflict. So I think that there is a repositioning. And the fact that the the Kazakhstan has not been really very close to the Erdogan regime may be one explanation or maybe just something diplomatic behind the doors that, that we are not really informed about. But looking at the Central Asia's point of view, now we have actually change of leadership in Uzbekistan, in Kyrgyzstan, as well as in Kazakhstan. So from their point of view, domestic politics is such that now authoritarianism more or less is there to stay. But Central Asians, as being pointed out, are increasingly uh, feeling the squeeze, especially from China, but also with Russia, that they are really surrounded by two major powers. So whatever comes from outside that may change that dependency or balance is hugely advantageous for them. And given the fact that Iran is a relatively, I guess, closed because of the sanctions opportunity, Turkey then becomes really a very credible one because of the obvious linguistic and other cultural uh, advantages, as opposed to, for example, South Korea. Otherwise, if you look at South Korea or Japan, There are other players that might actually contribute to that kind of opening to other 
regional powers to balance China and Russia. Mm. This is very interesting. The point uh, which you spoke about, the mutual feeling of need for a closer collaboration. But it, though, while speaking about the Turkish reorientation of foreign policy with regards to Central Asia, Dr. Ozan kind of spoke about what might be thinking in the region about their views of uh, Turkey. But I can't help to wonder, uh, despite the logic, on why it makes sense from both ends to, uh, to come closer to each other. I just keep thinking that it's been tried before in early 90s. Uh, and then there were so much enthusiasm on both ends uh, to bring the Turkic nations together. The Council of Turkic-speaking countries were established and there were regular meetings taking place on the highest level. But things fell apart gradually. Nothing substantial came out of those efforts. I mean, has anything changed from Central Asian perspective, which perhaps gives a hope that uh, things might be different at this time? I sound kind of pessimistic, but in the meantime, There are talented people at the Turkish foreign ministry, so this trip could not be happening for nothing, I guess. At least this is what I like to think about. Um, something has to be there. At least there has to be a context in which this is taking place. Maybe let's look into this uh, from the Central Asian perspective. Medit, is there anything changed from their perspective or in their view of Turkey in recent months or years that, that prompted the Turkish president to send his uh, top diplomat to Central Central Asia. Yeah, I think maybe some of it has been already developing for the last few years, which has been mentioned by some of our my co- colleagues here on this panel. This uh, relationship between Russia and China, and then somehow triangle makes it more stable and maybe multilateral in that sense. And Turkey comes quite handy in that perspective, given especially a long-standing relationship of all, or maybe except Tajikistan, uh, relationships uh, between Central Asian countries and and this country. So I think that uh, could have also added to viewing Turkey through a new lens from the from within the region. I think another perspective uh, which has been also maybe was affected by this uh, China's efforts with the Belt and Road. And then whenever you think about China on one side and then what happens on the other side of the uh, Central Asian uh, geographic map, then of course besides Europe, it's also Turkey. And in that sense, maybe it's also an additional element how you can use that Turkey is becoming maybe coming a bit in, in, in different other perspective. Then of course this uh, Karabakh war somehow maybe affected the situation and then of course Turkey was all over the news. And of course it also added to this bit more strained relationship between Turkey and Russia. And that of course sh- could have and should have resonated within Central Asia as well when it comes to a relationship between Central Asia and Turkey and then how it was viewed from Kremlin and then how it, governments in Central Asia calculated well what could be pluses and maybe some yeah. uh, challenges as well but maybe there are some moments of opportunities which they so they could utilize yeah. and uh, of course so what was mentioned already is openings uh what's new leadership in uzbekistan then yeah. we had our frequent changes of leadership in kyrgyzstan and these uh, moments of opportunities were quite often were also leading to rethinking not mm. drastically of course but then there's a perspective in regard to the foreign policy and how to work uh, in the different uh, dimensions not only with russia but mm. of course russia always means uh, a strategic most important partner mm-hmm. it is officially and explicitly but then uh, whatever other areas are being explored turkey is quite often comes as a possibility so mm-hmm. in that sense i think for new leadership with new opportunities coming up for shaping new policy agenda i think mm-hmm. turkey is also interesting highly uh, highlighted yeah yeah it's an interesting angle uh, uh, bruce i guess it is because of the leadership change that uh, uzbekistan decided to join the the council of turkic nations which which kind of changed the dynamics in the turkish uzbekistani relations i should say so what i'm saying is uh, how much of a factor the leadership change in uzbekistan might be playing in the context or in the background in which this was it's taking place uh, by asking this question i'm also kind of trying to drive the conversation towards the conclusion where we will look into uh, what comes next. I wouldn't say that, that Uzbek-Turkish relations were, were horrible when Karimov was alive, but, you, you know, of course, we remember the Nur Çilar of 20 years ago, they, and, and Karimov pulled all the Uzbek students mm. out of those schools uh, and wouldn't let them, the Nur Çilar have any hold in Uzbekistan whatsoever. So he, he always had that suspicion. I mean, Karima was real paranoid about you also, religious. You also remember, movements. Bruce, like uh, once, I guess, Soli was in Istanbul, like for a long time during Karimov's era. 
Right, you know, and it, it has, in fact, he still is there. You know, so th this was also a place where a lot of Uzbek opposition figures ended up leaving. Uh, they were fleeing to after that, and, you know, and Turkey gave, let them live there. Mm. Um, so there were reasons why Karimov would be suspicious about Turkey. You know, Mirzoev has tried to wipe the, the slate clean. You know, and, and of course, he's got the economic, uh, he, you know, he said the economic situation is a priority for him. And he's surely aware of the fact that, you know, the corridors west uh, eventually go through Turkey. At least if he doesn't want to go through Russia anyway. You know, and Uzbekistan has held talks specifically with Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan on using their ports to get the stuff across the Caspian Sea into Azerbaijan and then further over. Uh, in fact, they've even built a railway line to connect with Kazakhstan so they can get to the port at Oktal and uh, Kurik and use that. So, so you know, there is that element to their, their relationship, too, where Uzbekistan is really looking at Turkey ultimately as being a, a transit route for their trade with the Europe, certainly, which is important for them. Like I said, I, I think that was just something that Karimov didn't pay that much attention to. You know, unfortunately, it was it was always strange to me that he and other Uzbek officials would say, make a point of reminding everyone that Uzbekistan was one of one of two double landlocked countries in the world. And, and then at the same time, they antagonized their immediate neighbors so that they made it difficult to trade through those countries. Uh, you know, Mirzoev's opened up the, the doors through Turkmenistan and, and Kazakhstan, but to get everything further along, he needs good relations with someone in the Caucasus, and he needs good relations with Turkey. Um, so it's not so surprising that this is happening uh, at this moment. Mm. On, on that context, uh, though, Bruce, why he decided to skip Kazakhstan? Is there any, any possible reason that you could think of? I'm curious about that, too. We were trying to figure out if he might not double back on his way, you know, when he leaves Doha. Mm. But uh, I haven't seen any information that was true. I don't know why he would skip Kazakhstan. Mm. Um, that was, we, we talked about that a lot to try to figure out why that would be the case. And, and we couldn't come up with any good answers. So uh, it might have been just a time thing. And then they picked the three countries that they thought were most important to visit in Central Asia in the limited time they had. I don't know, you know, if that was the, the consideration or what it was. It does seem strange that he wouldn't visit Kazakhstan. Mm. And we are trying to figure that one out. Yeah, if you, you are talking about kind of re-energizing the Turkish Central Asia relations, yes, Uzbekistan is important. Uh, maybe Kyrgyzstan and Turkmenistan might be also a factor, but you know, you you like to to be in uh, in good shape with with Kazakhstan too. It's a major economic power there. So I think we need to be wrapping up the discussion uh, very soon, uh, very quickly, uh, Gulberna. So whatever the element making Turkey to look back into Central Asia, is there any reason or basis to think that now Chaosholu's visit is going to be kind of a, a new beginning of some stronger relationship, some deeper relationship? Is there basis to hope for something like that? No matter what happens, uh, the relationship will continue. But mm. based on what kind of foreign policy the AKP, the current ruling government and President Erdogan pursued during the past two decades, I'm not convinced that it is going to be a sustainable, well-planned relationship between Turkey and Central Asia, because what they have done over the years, just playing one side against the other without having a consistent strategic plan. But second point, point uh, I want to make is this is a relationship among authoritarian regimes. None of these countries have said anything against Uyghurs and their incarceration in mm. China. That yeah. makes me feel like, you know, this is an alliance among autocrats who don't even have the guts to defend their own people or their own close cultural zone against an authoritarian brute system that we see in China. So does it have a vision? Does does it rest on a, a, a diplomatic uh, plan? Does it bring anything to people, ordinary people, in terms of the future of this relationship, in terms of livelihoods? So I hope I'm wrong. I wish I'm wrong. This is an ephemeral, tactical, and, and just short-term relationship, as it has been over the uh, number of years. Interesting. Uh, Medet, where your eyes will be going forward in terms of the Turkish Central Asia relations? Anything this visit is going to change? Uh, generally, I would view maybe this visit, at least from what I've seen in Kyrgyzstan, that uh, somehow is just uh, restating what has been so far and then just to, as usually what is communicated after this uh, official statements is just uh, trying to reinforce whatever exists and I'm not expecting much of a breakthrough 
maybe hope for something which can deepen and maybe widen, but to what extent it may happen, it's of course mm-hmm. a good question. Okay. Bruce, the same question to you. I mean, is there anything particular you will be looking at going forward? Well, you know, as I mentioned earlier, these the countries in Central Asia are always trying to balance their, their relations mm-hmm. um, with different groups. They don't want to be too dependent on Russia or too dependent on China or too dependent on the West or anything like that. So I, I understand why they, they want to make sure that they keep the Turkish ties open. And I also see that Turkey, at least it seems to me that they're trying to press kind of their advantage. You know, they're on a roll. I was in Central Asia in the late 90s and then again uh, right after, you know, in, in 2001. And in both those, or in 2002, excuse me, and in both those cases, the U.S. The U.S. had been in the Balkans and the U.S. had, had just gotten into Afghanistan. And the, the view of the U.S. was incredibly favorable because they militarily, they, they seemed to be, they had the ball rolling. They seemed to be making gains and stuff. And it really impressed the people out there that that happened. Now, that fell apart later. But I think Turkey kind of in that same situation now, everyone kind of understands that Azerbaijan was so successful in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict because they had backing of Turkey and, and Turkish equipment. You know, so this is a good time for them to come because I think the people are going to look at them, you know, a little different and more favorably, like I said, than they would have half a year or a year ago or something like that. I think the problem with this, you know, especially since it is Turkey, is that we know that historically Russia and Turkey don't have good relations. And we don't know. There's some places where Turkey and Russia cooperate and there's some places where they don't. You know, so so I'll be actually trying to watch Moscow and see what their reaction is. Uh, If ties do continue to get better, you know, how long Moscow will let this go on before they try to rein this in a little Mm -hmm. bit, reassert themselves in the region somehow. I think that that's an interesting point, Bruce. I mean, one area where we could be paying attention in this regard might be the level of the Turkish company's involvement in the development of gas fields in Caspian Sea and how Russia might react to that. Let's see. Uh, I think with that, we need to uh, wrap up the discussion here. It was great talking to all of you. Thank you very much, Bruce Panier, uh, the editor of Radio Free Radio Liberty Central Asia blog, Kishlok Awazi, Medet Tolugan of a department chair and professor at the American University of Central Asia. Medet was joining us from Bishkek and uh, Gulberna Özcan, a reader in international business and entrepreneurship at Royal Holloway University of London. Thank Thank you very much for joining us and for your time in Tadis. And uh, this is it from me, Mohamed Tahir, Ready for Free the Liberties Media Manager and host of the Majlis podcast here in Washington. Until next week, bye-bye.